Welcome to the Everyday Mindfulness Show, the -the off-the-cuff exploration of everyday aha moments and life experiences. Join a cast of over 70 uniquely brilliant individuals. Each week, Mike Domish and an eclectic mix of cast members and special guests will engage in mindful and lively conversations about everything from meditation to spirituality to personal passions to successes and failures to relationships to the stuff that makes up the moments of our daily lives. Let's get started with your host, author, speaker, provocateur, and a bit of a goofball, Mike Domish. One of our amazing sponsors this week is Zen Parenting Radio. Zen Parenting Radio podcast combines self-awareness and mindfulness with pop culture and humor to expand compassion for ourselves, each other, and the world. You're going to hear a discussion between a spiritual and emotional mom and a logical and practical dad, a podcast to help you feel outstanding. Join my friends, Kathy and Todd, at zenparentingradio.com. Hello, yes, I'm your host, Mike Domish, and thrilled to be here with our cast from the Everyday Mindfulness Show. This week's cast includes Alan Anderson and Darren Tipton. Of course, you can learn all about them and our entire brilliant cast at EverydayMindfulnessShow.com. Once again, that's EverydayMindfulnessShow.com. Today's show, we're going to be discussing the armor of our insecurity. Now, this was inspired back from when I was reading the book, Breakfast with Buddha, specifically page 264. And the book was written by Roland Marullo. And here is the part of the book that we're going to discuss that I'm pulling this quote from. The statement from the book is, people make the armor from their smartness or their anger or their quiet or their fear or their being busy or their being nice. Some people make it from a big show, always talking. Some make it by being very important. Alan, how does someone identify what armor they tend to use or are currently using? First of all, I think the quote is really delicate and subtle. There's so many, so many ways we cover up ourselves or armoring as his, as his word is. How we actually notice that is, I think, another question completely different. Um, I don't know if I'm getting off track here, but I love getting off track right away. (laughs) (laughs) So I think that it's really difficult to see what that armor is. I think that is one of the most difficult spiritual things in the whole world, actually. That's a really profound question. To be able to see ourselves is, is, I think, the essence of spirituality of any kind, of any religion. And if we can't do that... How in the world can we call ourselves practitioners or meditators or or Christians or people who pray? To be able to see that, I personally feel like you actually need the help of other people. Mm -hmm. I think we can see so much into ourselves, and but at a certain point, like this is the beauty of having a meditation instructor or a therapist or some kind of mentor, someone who's going to be able to speak to you directly. And when that doesn't happen, it is so, so easy to armor up, to just not pay attention to what's actually going on and to live in a complete fantasy. Well, that reminds me, and, and I've discussed this before, but years ago I went through a program from Landmark Education called the Forum and then the Advanced Course. And the big breakthrough for me there was learning my armor because that's a big piece of what they work on is, you know, what are your acts? And these are the things that you tend to turn to under pressure, under stress. What, you know, what do you turn to and what do you do there? But also how you project yourself to the world. And I was truly naive to a major perception about myself that I would have never have gotten. Well, I don't know that never. But until this point in my life, which was I was, what, 43 at the time, I had not gotten until a group of people looked me in the face and said, uh, duh, you know, like, how do you not <laughs> to see this? And what's amazing is that when I had the breakthrough about myself and how I projected myself and I would go back to people close to me, they go, are you serious? You didn't know that about yourself? And you're sitting there going, well, that hurt. <laughs> you know, like that was, <laughs> this is not a positive thing I learned, but it's what you just said, Alan, without them putting the mirror up and going, don't you see it? You don't see it. I love what, what we've already highlighted, and that is there's a certain self-awareness that we may have, uh, and maybe we identify some of these as it the, refers to the armors that we wear, but that element of 
a second set of eyes or a third set of eyes that says, let me peel the onion for you because I'm seeing your blind side that you're not aware of. I think that has power. I think there's a tension to me when I think about, okay, what, what, what armor do I personally wear? I think there's a tension between the armor I wear and the armor I want to wear. I love that. I Can you dive more into that, Derek? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it came to my, I mean, there's that struggle. It's the struggle that says, okay, if, even if I am aware, even if I've listened to those around me, friends or professionals, and I'm, I, I know this little bit of tension, I guess it begs the question, who is it? And talking of the, the realm of mindfulness and spirituality, who is it I want to be? What do I want to be known as? But also, who do I, regardless of what I wear, who is it that I want to be? What, what disciplines, what spiritual activity do I want to be involved with that takes me to the place of where I want to be? That, to me, is the, the struggle that I have, that tension. Well, and, and that we're going to have this. Like, just because we have the yeah. discovery doesn't mean it goes away. You know, I, I talk about that a lot, that when I had that discovery, it doesn't mean that the next day, oh, my life is free of that. No, it's the opposite. It's always going to be part of who I am. It's part of my wiring and that, that, that I can project that. So now it is, am I aware of that? Am I mindful of when that is showing? Am I catching it as it shows, before it shows, or even after to be able to address it? Because even after is better than never. And I think what's interesting about this quote is I don't think there's an answer to which, mm-hmm. to which one you use. Because I think we use them very circumstantial. You know, if I look at smartness, anger, quiet, fear, being busy, being nice, big show, talking, I've done them all. And you know, what's also interesting as you were saying that, I think there's also armor that comes from what we perceive to be our gender roles. I'm the husband, I'm the wife, I'm the man, I'm the woman. There's certain things that we wear because maybe society expects this, maybe family expects this, and to uh, kind of dig a little bit deeper into those those roles that we play and how it brings this certain armor, this certain awareness that we're, you know, this image that we're protecting. Yeah. I think that's also very interesting. And, and it can be cultural roles. I know a couple where they both grew up in opposite as far as their environment culturally gender-wise. So what I mean by that is one had all siblings that were brothers. One had all siblings that were sisters. But what was interesting was it was the woman, the person who identified as a woman who had all brothers. It was a person who identified as a man that had all sisters. And they ended up bringing to the relationship the actual family they grew up in, not this stereotypical gender role. So the woman would be more likely to be quiet and not want to talk about it. The guy would want to talk about everything because they grew up in that culture. And so I think that impacts too. Just in those examples, Mike, we have exposure to situations that highlight our armor. So like if you are typically, you know, act like the, the historical typical male, not listening enough, uh, or if you fall into any kind of sort of an outlook and you just don't want to see it at all, it's going to be very, very difficult to see that unless you have some exposure. So, you know, how are you going to think about people of color if you're, if you're a, pers- a white person and you don't even see what privilege is? You know, it's like, so, uh, yeah, all these roles come up, I think, in our societal interactions. So is it a matter of figuring out what triggers the insecurity, not as much about figuring out which one I'm using as insecurity, or is it important for both? In other words, do I need to be aware of whether I'm using smartness, anger, talking, being nice, being busy? Or do I need to be more focused on what triggers me to do those things? Or is it a combination of both? I think it's, I think it's the mindfulness part that you just mentioned, Mike. That it's like, that's the part that first notices it and says, oh, that's going on. And, but then there's so many other roadblocks beyond that. One of, the, of them I think of is, is just being humble enough to accept who you are. Number two is to have humor and be able to say, I think that for myself, again, coming upon my own situation like you did, Mike, where, some, where you had to go, oh, my goodness, this is what I am. This is what I do. This is what everybody sees. To be able to relate to that in a humorous way is a way to, I think, make inroads into it and not keep trying to cover it up, you know, but to be able to say, here I go again. This is what I do. And, that, and to have a little bit of joy about that and share that with people, I think, for me, that has opened up tremendously 
my ability to share that with others and not be embarrassed and not not try to hide further. Well, and what's interesting is that when you meet someone who's like you that way, how much you see it in them, but not necessarily yourself. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and that's the interesting part. And as you learn about yourself, you start to recognize that connection and why it can be a negative for you if you don't recognize it because they're not recognizing it and it's annoying you. you know, that, that type of, so, you know, I can think of I'm known as a talker. Anybody who's known me since a child knows that Mike doesn't allow quiet space to exist a whole lot. Uh, and so. <laughs> I, I know that about myself. And it, what as I get more mindful, I am much better with quiet. But if we're on a ride and the car's quiet, I'm probably talking to fill space. And I catch it now. And I sometimes just enjoy the quietness. I would have never have had that experience without somebody you know being awakened. But what's interesting is when I'm with somebody who cannot stop talking, I am so sensitive to it. <laughs> I, I get so annoyed by it. And I don't think in the past I did. I think it's because I'm seeing what I don't like of my past in that person, and it's reminding me of me. Uh, it's almost the it's almost the principle: you spot it, you got it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So explain that a you little know, more, Darren. I, I'm like you. If there's something that you know, you pick that something and said, "This is what I dislike in somebody," or I, I find inconvenient, or it rubs me the wrong way in somebody else. In my own life, I have to say, "Well, why does that person?" kind of rub me. Why do I see that in the, well, it's because Darren, you are that person. That's the trait that you have that, you know, that maybe you need to work on. And it's interesting for the person who's been walking in kind of the spiritual path of enlightenment and of just being mindful. These principles make a lot of sense and, and we connect easily to them, the self-evaluation using, you know, the groups around us, people around us. But for the person who maybe is just starting a journey of finding mindfulness, I think it's it's important to say that identifying, in this case, the armors that we keep, um, helps us develop peace from within. It helps us with basic spiritual disciplines, just to be authentic, to be our authentic self. So when we think about, you know, I, this person rubs me the wrong way, I often have to think, okay, what is it about them that I do myself? That's that's brilliant because it allows you to be more open to them too. Not just the discovery for yourself, but to appreciate sure. them more as a human being. <laughs> I'm just going to pause this for one second because I want to let everyone listening know about one of our amazing sponsors. One of our sponsors this week is the Can I Kiss You book. And if you listen to the show, you know that is actually my book. Came out in 2016, went number one for teen and young adult dating on Amazon new release. You can get that on Amazon. You can get that at datesafeproject.org. The book is Can I Kiss You? I think it's obvious these days from what we learned in psychology that whatever we see out there that does annoy us, annoys us because we engage in it to some degree. I think we're all been saying the same thing, but I think that's the point. I, I'm thinking of a, a talk I was at once by a great uh, Tibetan teacher. Her name is Khandro Rinpoche, and she t teaches very high compl complex material, but one of the most striking things she ever said was, Maybe what you so-called senior students should do, is, <laughs> referring to those of us who have been around for way too long, um, <laughs> what you should do is perhaps go up to someone that knows you well and say, what's something that you think that everybody notices about, everyone can notice about me, but I don't notice it in myself? Mm -hmm. That's a, And give them the freedom to answer. Because I think that's the interesting part. Will they answer if they know your insecurities? Right, because if I if I ask that question and you think I get defensive, you're not answering that question, right? Unless you don't care. Like, I mean, either you care so deeply you will answer it, or you're thinking you're it's not worth me going there. <laughs> They're not going to take on that conflict for that because you caused that culture, though. That's not their fault. You caused that. And what's interesting that I find is that who helps us protect those armors? That, that's a conversation we often don't have. Who do we surround ourselves with that allow us to keep that armor and, in, in fact, reinforces it? Great question. Darren, take it away. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I think it's the principle that if, if one person peels the first layer of the, of the onion, especially if you're in a group setting where you're sharing and that sort of thing, it's – it just sets the, the stage for other people to feel that level of comfort or whatever. But 
I had a friend recently who said, what do you think people perceive me at as work? And I said, well, I think they perceive you to be very business and business only, and you don't smile, and you seem very focused. And he said, well, any suggestions so I can like, be more warmly received? I said, bring cookies, just see what happens. So, he, <laughs> so several things that he did, and a, you know, a couple of weeks later, he said, I don't like it. I was known as a person who got the job done, and now people are coming up to me and talking, and it's opened up a whole different... So, it's interesting, even in the workplace, if you're thinking about maybe being more authentic, looking at some of your armor layers, and you start peeling those off, people, you may even, be, you may even perceive of the situation, you're being treated differently, or people may, in his words, be taking advantage of him. So I don't know. I mean, that's a, it's, a great, it's a great question. Peel, the la- peel one layer back, uh, and what happens? Well, and I guess what I'm referring to is the person who you identify your armor and they tell you, mm-hmm. don't remove it. That's what I love about you. Okay. So, yeah. so I, I had that. When I had this breakthrough, I reached out to a lot of people. And several of my closest friends were like, what are you talking about? That's what I love about you. And so they didn't, they're like, don't change, don't change, don't change. And I said, well, wait, I can still be those things you like, but in a gentle, caring way. So right. I was known mm-hmm. for being blunt, uh, you know, and I can still say the truth, but more... And what's interesting was, and and I've never forgotten that moment, one of my friends called back the next day who said, don't change. I love that about you. Don't change. And said, I found out why I told you don't change, Mike. Because I went back to my wife and told her about our conversation. She said, of course you told Mike not to change because you're Mike. Mm -hmm. And you don't Mm -hmm. want Mike to change because that means you would have to change. And him having that conversation with me was like, whoa, good for me to know that because I need to now be aware of what friends are playing that role. Because... I need to be conscious of that's a possibility that people are telling me not to change because uh, they really are connecting with me. And so I need to weigh that into this equation when I'm hearing their feedback. It, mm-hmm. It's so it's so incredible, the power of habit. You know, that's what we're, I think we're really working with in conjunction with when we're doing any kind of spiritual practice is there's this habit that's logged deep into us. You know, it's like hardware and software all together is one. And uh, when we have that much hardware that is so habitual, people carry that and support that habit with us. So we have a kind of mutual Mm -hmm. backslap society, you know? Um, Mm -hmm. Well, you just inspired me to think of another question, which I love the question you said earlier about what do you see in me that you think other people don't see is, or another question is, what do you think is something you think I think is a strength of me that hurts me at times or that, that has a negative impact at times? Because I think often our strengths are tied to these armors. I know for me, I had that discovery when this breakthrough happened and I was calling one of those friends. Sometimes you don't see that in your strengths is, is the problem. And what, I'll give you an example. I was with one of those friends having this, just sharing the discovery I had. And one of them said, Mike, that room takes me back to when I told you, yeah, I was being very blunt in a setting with close colleagues where we were masterminding and sharing with each other. And somebody said the way to, to wealth is this and whatever answer they gave, they were doing at that time and it wasn't working. And I simply said, you sure about that? Because they seemed so sure, but it was failing them. And they turned to me and they're like, are, are you a jerk? Did you, are you actually trying to help me? And, and the room laughed and said, Mike, if we didn't love you and know how much value you bring and how much insight you bring us, yeah, we might think you're, you're an asshole, but we know how much you love us and how much you give to us. So we love that about you. And I, at the time, thought, oh, they love my bluntness. I did not hear at all that, hey, this is, you know, we love you because we can look past it. I didn't hear that. I heard we love you, right? And so it's amazing what we hear. So if we're able to go back, and our friend, my friend brought that up. They're like, do you remember three years ago, that conversation? That was a great example, Mike. And so what I thought was a strength, being blunt, was doing harm at times. Now, other people said I, they loved it. It was a strength. They loved that strength and it helped them. But I argue that I bet I could have helped them without being that harsh, right? And I didn't think I was being harsh. I just thought I was being efficient, right? Getting to the point. I think it helps to look back also and say, where have, I, where have you seen me do that? Because I think when you ask friends or people close to you, where have you seen me do that? When they give us precise examples, it's often not the ones you expected. And so it's another awakening of how it shows. This reminds me of a quote by Shinryu Suzuki. 
I may not have the words exactly right, but he was talking to his students and said, you are all perfect as you are, and you all need a lot of work. <laughs> That's <laughs> so awesome. I think it's both. I yeah. think it's both, you know, the good qualities. And we just have to face that we have good attributes and we have or we have positive attributes and we have negative attributes and everyone comes with that and i think the the fear of having having people believe that you actually have negative attributes is 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 what stops people from sharing you know we just have to all if we can all say i have this good positive attribute and i have this negative attribute and equally i'm willing to show them to you and equally exp- you know, express who I am and not hide one or the other or highlight one or the other to try to hide another part. Yeah, I, I love that. I'm in my affirmations. I, one of the sentences in there is I am fallible, right? Because that's, that's part of being a being, right? Of being human. I'm fallible and that's okay. Right. And I will, I will fall down and I will rise strong. And that's, that's more of a, a Brene Brown, you know, statement that yeah. she talks about, but allowing ourselves to have compassion to say, this is okay that I have this discovery. I'm not having the discovery to feel like crap about myself. I'm having the discovery to learn more about myself and be aware and be mindful and see where that shows. Because sometimes that is needed. That strength we're talking about that can be a weakness. You just got to know which people, right? You have to be mindful there. Who needs that? Yeah, I think it's a funny trick um, for all of us who are engaged in any kind of spiritual path that mindfulness and that spirituality becomes another little type of armor. And that's what the most subtle one to see and the most difficult one to see for all of us. Yeah, I'm reminded of another quote, uh, by this time by Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche. This is one of my favorite quotes. It's on the cover page of my webpage, The Wisdom Splinter. It says, It is much easier to appear holy than to be sane. <laughs> it is much easier to appear holy than to be sane. And that, that to me is like, Something that should be on every written on the back of the hand of every spiritual teacher. <laughs> right, right. I mean, because we we do have a culture worldwide that is about showing versus being. Right? And so are you showing your belief systems or you know, are you whether it's religion, spirituality, mindfulness? Because those are very different things, right? We've talked about that in other shows too, that we have to be careful because religion and mindfulness can be very different things, but can integrate together. We tend to want to show. And so showing holy is different than being holy. You have people that show holy in a way that doesn't look holy at all. Like you're sitting there going, hmm, who's the person that you, was your leader you're talking about? They don't seem they'd be on the same page as you, but you're showing, you're showing holy. That's different than being. What are readings, books, movies, some form of taking in that you've had that have helped you both with the discovery of you, your armor that you use and being able to be aware of that and how it shows itself. One book that I read this mind, the masks, the masks we wear, I think it's, and then how to live without them. I think it's Sloan that wrote that just a really good take on this particular topic that we've had today. Cool. Thank you. I mentioned in an earlier, one of our earlier episodes that Daniel Goldman has been really inspiring me lately. Some that allows me to see that there are other capacities that we have beyond mindfulness to really become a good human being and show ourselves up as a good member of our society and of our group and our family and everything. And so it's been helpful to me to look past that armor of hiding behind the whole mindfulness thing and looking at how our emotions show up. So uh, Daniel Goldman's an emotional intelligence book has been very helpful to me. Awesome. Thank you both for being on today's show. It's been a great conversation. For everyone listening, please know you've been listening to Alan Anderson and Darren Tipton, of which you can learn all about both of them. Find their website, their links, everything at everydaymindfulnessshow.com. And until next time, may you enjoy everyday mindfulness in your life. Three quick reminders. One, please subscribe to the Everyday Mindfulness Show on iTunes. Already subscribed? Then encourage others to join us by inviting them to subscribe to the show. Two, while on iTunes, download all the latest episodes. Three, reviews help more people find out about the show. Would you please go into iTunes and write a review? Doing so helps spread the mission of the show. Thanks. 
appreciate you being a part of our vibrant, oftentimes silly, and always vulnerable community. If you have an idea, a thought, want to sponsor the show, or just want to say hi, send us an email at listen at everydaymindfulnessshow.com and check us out at everydaymindfulnessshow.com. Have a joyful, mindful week.